You guys hear me okay? I have a big voice, so it just sounds like there's something always, but it doesn't. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. We, just, we all agree that we're going to sit here and feel like we're amongst the table. It's kind of preachy up there. Um, I'd just like to first of all, yeah, good morning to everybody and uh, uh, acknowledge the traditional territory of the, of the Algonquin. Uh, it's always an honor to, uh, to visit um, all the territories throughout Canada. I guess just to, uh, to start off with an introduction of myself, um, like I said yesterday, my Haida name is Kiltlatska. So in Haida uh, custom, we're all gifted our, our Haida names at various stages of our life. Oh. And uh, my Haida name was given to me upon my graduation. So the neat thing about when you get a Haida name is you don't know whether or not you know, people give you that name because of who they think you are or if you become, you become that after you're given a name. So my name, Kiltlatska, means uh, one who stands with a strong voice. So when I was in high school, I didn't have a big strong voice. So it's kind of one of those interesting things where either I was already going to become this and my elders knew that, or you know, I became that because it was bestowed upon me to, to live up to that name. So I'm just sharing that because um, you know, I think we've all introduced ourselves with our Haida names and my colleagues have all done the same. So I think it's just important that you know, I guess, what the names mean. Uh, it, uh, my, Haida, my English name is Peter Lanton. So maybe just a little, quick little introduction about my background. Uh, I don't think Jody's here today, but uh, well, first and foremost, I'm Haida, but I'm also a military brat. So why I ended up at Carleton University is, a, is really a, a result of that. Uh, I grew up all over, all over Canada. I was born in Bermuda. My dad's French, you know, so you, you couldn't even make this stuff up. <laughs> but um, it really shaped who I am, you know, a very, very unique um, background. But I think, uh, you know, just because I'm at Carleton, you know, there's something really symbolic about being here. And I really believe that all these things happen for a reason. But I remember uh, when I was telling you the story about being here at, at Carleton and being so upset about what I was learning. I remember what it was and it came back to me because I used to write articles about it. But I remember what I was so, so mad about was I just found out I was an Indian. <laughs> you know, when I came to Carleton University. So my whole life, I lived my life as myself. And, I spent a lot of time in Haida Gwaii. I'd go back for every summer and I lived most of my life there. But when I left Haida Gwaii and came here, that's, what, that's the aha, I was like, I was mad because I found out I was an Indian and I never knew it. Nobody told me that. So that was just kind of you know, the, the, the opening, I guess the, the start of my journey. And I think another interesting element of uh, you know, how things happen at certain times in your life is when I came here and I found out I was an Indian, uh, my mother, uh, who is who's Haida, was working at the Assembly of First Nations, and she ended up being the secretary to Ovid Mekrity. So they used to have social gatherings at our house, and, uh, and I would be there. I was in my first year of university, and so I'd have Ovid, I'd, I'd, I remember this vividly. I had Ovid Mekrity, Elijah Harper, Dave Montour, all these world, you know, world-renowned leaders sitting in our living room talking politics. and. I don't think I sat there trying to absorb it, but just by being there, I, I really believe I absorbed just being in, in the presence of that. So that was kind of you know, what shifted uh, my whole life. And I'm not going to get into my whole life, but I just want to, you know, just because I'm at Carleton and 24 years later, you know, to be in this room is, uh, is, is really, it really means something. Uh, it's really special to me. So I'm really happy to be here and, and share that with you. Uh, so I'm not here alone, you know, and I think I, I, you know, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Jason Alsop, Leslie Brown, Trevor Russ. And, uh, you know, we're here for a specific purpose. You know, we're here to share. So I think, you know, the primary reason of my presentation is to share with you the journey of the Haida Nation. But I think the interesting part about the name of what we're here is, you know, this, this transitional governance project is the Haida Nation is a government in transition. Uh, we've been transitioning for quite some time now, you know, for about 40 years or so. So we're here, you know, to really share and, you know, and I like the idea of the think tank. It feels like it's different. I don't feel like I'm sitting here just telling you guys a story and then we'll walk away and that'll be that. I really believe that the purpose of us being here is to share, you know, get creative around what's next for our nations and, uh, and that we're not alone. And I think that's the, 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 big, the biggest thing, especially when you live where we live. I uh, could feel pretty lonely at times. 
So I just encourage you guys that, you know, we, we brought our, like, uh, Trevor, Jason, and Trevor, or Trevor, Jason, and Leslie, uh, we're the executive of the Council of Haida Nation. We all have our specific uh, scopes of why we're here, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a time for, you know, for each of them to talk about, you know, briefly around, you know, what their specific focus is for everybody to know so that you can ask questions and engage. But I'm going to start off with, you know, try to go through the history of the Haida Nation as quickly as possible without trying to skip over the, the main parts. But really get into you know, lessons learned and what's next. I think that's where I, you know, where I really want to kind of sink into, into the conversation. So for those, uh, oh, there we go, I got to point it. So for those that don't know where Haida Gwaii is, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure everybody does, but this is to show you in relation to Vancouver Island in British Columbia, uh, where Haida Gwaii uh, is situated. So we have a, a, a beautiful island. This is just uh, another image of Haida Gwaii from, from space. A lot of what you're going to have, I'm not going to, you're not going to be reading a lot. I just put some images up for you to look at um, while I kind of tell, tell a bit of the story. So I have to make a, a disclosure here. After um, Stephen Cornell's presentation yesterday, I swear that I had this presentation done before I heard your presentation. <laughs> but there's, a, there's some pretty scary similarities in some of the messaging. So this is a map of, uh, of Haida Gwaii uh, in pre-contact times. So back in the day, you know, the Haida were a very strong, very strong culture. Our culture was strong. Uh, we have lots of, lots of stories of, uh, of our escapades up and down the coast. But back in, the, in these days, uh, the Haida Nation occupied all of Haida Gwaii. Some of the work that we've been working on in our title case right now, uh, we now have a very comprehensive place names map you know, that goes back and shows our presence throughout the land base of Haida Gwaii. So it's just really important to know prior to contact, pre-colonial times, that, you know, our history shows that this was our presence on Haida Gwaii. We covered all of it, and, uh, and we have a very strong history uh, because of that. But I guess, um, you know, our story is one that's probably very similar to a lot of you. Uh, there's been a lot of people uh, coming to Haida Gwaii, and, uh, you know, a, a very bad history of exploitation and, 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 and abusing, abusing our islands. But this is what we call home, old growth forests. You know, very, uh, very beautiful place in the world. Uh, we have, uh, you know, some characteristics of Haida Gwaii that are unique. Uh, one of them being is that, you know, using forestry terms, the mean annual increment, which is, you know, how quickly the trees grow, uh, is one of the highest MAIs in the world is on Haida Gwaii. So we're situated in a very unique position uh, in the world. And this is just to give you a little glimpse of uh, what we call home. This is not working now. Why not you? OK. So within that story, obviously, is uh, you know, the Indian Act. You know, so this is just to give you a glimpse of, you know, from our point of view, when you look at our history, you know, what's been taught to us around, you know, our presence on the land base of how, um, you know, our story is unfolded around where we were put, you know, through, you know, a very, very horrible few hundred years of residential school and smallpox. But this is just to look, give you an indication on the land base of what the Indian reserves look like on Haida Gwaii. So you can see how, you know, how we've opposed uh, this reality, you know, where they, where they believe that our, our place on Haida Gwaii is on 0.16% of the land base. So it's a very, uh, very stark um, realization of, of what we're up against. So this is also another example of some of the, the difficult history uh, for the Haida Nation. So in about the 1920s is when uh, industrial logging got introduced uh, to Haida Gwaii. So over the years, uh, this has be become you know, part of our history, become a lot of their story. So it's just some more visuals of, of what uh, Haida Nation was seeing, you know, being situated on that 0.16% of the land base and what was happening in the traditional territories that we used to call home. So there's, uh, you know, at the, at the height of logging, around 3 million cubic meters uh, was the allowable annual cut at, at its height. And so if you look at uh, the history of Haida Gwaii, um, this is going to give you an example of the rate of logging, about how it affected uh, Haida Gwaii. So if you just watch, it's a, it's a time lapse over 100 years to show you all the yellow is the places that were logged off.
Wow. You can do it again. So everybody that sees this says, you know, it looks like a virus, you know, something that just right. spreads like wildfire. But it just gives you, an, an, a, you know, another visual of just how rampant and how fast, you know, the rate of logging was going. So this is very hard. It's very hard to, to, to see and, and, to, and to experience and to have part of your history. But within uh, this dark story and this dark reality is, uh, is a pretty amazing, um, amazing story. So back in uh, 1985, uh, this is really where things started turning around for the Haida Nation. I'm not too sure uh, how many people know the story of Lyle Island and, and, and that fight. So I don't want to get into uh, you know, too much of the story because of the limited time. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was the awakening for the Haida Nation. So in 1985 is when uh, you know, a group of our elders, a group of our, our grassroots people got together and, uh, and tried to mobilize to try to say that they, were gonna, they had enough. You know, they had enough with, uh, with, the, with the practices and then the, the rate of logging. And uh, they mobilized. So part of the story, you know, talked, you know, is, you know, based on our history, we're, you know, we're a warrior culture. A lot of our young men uh, mobilized and, and, and all went down to Lyle Island and prepared to confront the logging companies. For the first time really in our history is when we decided that enough was enough. So what happened was uh, we went down to a very remote part of Haida Gwaii. Uh, they set up a, a camp with cabins and, you know, the whole, like all the communities were emptying their freezers. It was in the middle of the winter. And they all went down there and were, and were getting ready for the long haul. So the, the amazing part of the story is that, you know, they're gearing up for the confrontation at Lyle. And uh, nobody knew what was going on. There wasn't a strategy around getting the world engaged. This was all just about putting a stop to what was happening. And so a confrontation was getting ready to take place. And, uh, you know, just literally the, the day before the big clash was set to happen, a uh, helicopter came in. And off the helicopter came uh, these four elders. And so the elders came, you know, everybody thought that they were there to, you know, offer their support or maybe even pull the plug, because it was never done at the time. Nobody knew what was going to happen, and people were fearful of what could happen. So talking to some of the warriors that were there, you know, they were thinking that they were there for support or, or to, you know, tell them not to do it. They didn't want anybody to get hurt. And so what uh, happened was neither of those, you know, the elders were actually there and they respectfully asked the warriors to stand down. And you know, again, they thought because they just didn't want them to move forward, but uh, what surprised them the most is what they said is that they wanted them to stand down and let them take their place. And so that's the, that's the power, that's the significance of the story is that these four elders, one who is my grandmother, uh, my nani, uh, Fussy Marks, Ada Yovanovich, Watson Price, uh, the four of them you know, took the line and their rationale was that they waited their whole life for this. So it was like that powerful moment where you know, the warriors reluctantly, because they wanted to fight, they, they respectfully agreed. And they stepped aside, and those four elders took their place, and then, they, and then so on, you know, the, the confrontation uh, was ready to take place. But what a powerful thing you know, to have uh, people that have, you know, my grandmother, my nani, lived her whole life watching you know, what we're talking about here, the life of pre-colonial times, to the Indian Act, to the loss of culture, to, this, to finally, we're going to do something as a people. So it really set the stage, you know, it set the stage for something big. Oh, I guess I'm pointing at you, right? <laughs> so the confrontation happened and, you know, it, uh, the RCMP got involved. Um, there wasn't any violence, you know, it was done very respectfully. But it ended up in, you know, in this environment where the RCMP got in and our elders were actually arrested at Lyle. And, uh, you know, them along with around 70 other uh, of our people uh, were technically arrested at Lyle Island. So it changed, uh, it changed a lot. You know, it changed everything for the Haida Nation. It, it changed the course of our history. You know, and I think this is just a beautiful, another visual of uh, Fussy Marks, uh, you know, walking a, you know, a, a man-made logging road, you know, in our, in our traditional territory. Mm -hmm. So what happened uh, immediately after this is really where, you know, where I want, I want to get into. So I guess to bring you back to, you know, this is just around the Lyle Island time, 1985. We like to use maps to show you, you know, presence, you know, about where we were at and where everyone else was at on the land base. 
So if you look at this map, you know, it shows you, you know, keep in mind the yellow, the yellow dots are still on there. But all that red area, you know, that was where the forest companies, you know, technically that was their rights to log. So, you know, the majority of Haida Gwaii was in the hands of, 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 you know, the logging companies. All of the blue was the timber supply area, you know, which again is logging. And the practices was clear cutting. You know, these guys weren't targeting specific species. They were mowing down from, you know, stream to mountain top. It was absolute devastation. And the timber supply area, of course, is the provincial tenures and so on. And the provincial parks is the, is the green area where, um, you know, was set aside as, as provincial parks, but had zero involvement of the Haida Nation. We weren't involved in creating those, and we weren't involved in managing those or having any presence on it. So back in 1980, we were still the yellow dots. So I think, you know, even before the Standall Isle Island is where the Council of Haida Nation uh, was, already, was already created. So in 1974, a group of our grassroots people got together around this notion of land claims and said, you know, we have to do something about this. We have to organize ourselves. And so in 1974, uh, the Council of Haida Nation was born. Immediately, uh, we were talking about how, uh, what, what do we want to be? What are we? You know, we're not a band council, we're not a trial, we're not, we're not any of these things, we're just a group of people that wanted, would want to do something. But we knew early on that the way we were going to move ourselves forward it was using Canada's tools. You know, so this notion of a, of a constitution to lay out who we are and, and what we want to do as a government uh, was, the, was the idea very early on. So we're, uh, you know, we're now in 2017, but in 2003 we, we adopted a constitution. And the Constitution, you know, lays out, you know, the mandate of the Council of Haida Nation. So this is all available on the Haida Nation website, so you can find all the documents there. So I'm not going to get into the details of what they all say, but it lays out, you know, our purpose as the, the government. So, you know, Haida sovereignty, you know, and it also talks about where our authority de is derived from. You know, it comes from the land base. It comes from the surrounding waters. It, you know, it, it talks about where our authority as the governing body, where it comes from. And of course, what our goal is, which is really to protect Haida Gwaii uh, for the next generation. The Constitution also lays out, you know, our full, you know, who we are, our full independence, our sovereignty, you know, our purpose, you know, is to pursue the self-sufficiency of the Haida Nation. So keep in mind, this language was, was coming about in around, around the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty interesting in 2017, here we are, you know, listening to, the, you know, the government of Canada talking about self-determination and nation to nation and, you know, our ancestors, our forefathers and elders were the ones that had the foresight that this was how it's going to be. So just, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get into too much of the details of the, you know, what's in the Constitution, but it talks about, you know, perpetuating our culture and our heritage. So that's also, you know, our, that's, our, that's our role as a government. I thought one of the, the presentations yesterday put it so beautifully that I'm going I'm to try not to steal it because I think that's a terrible word, but I'm going to borrow it. But the intergenerational transmission of identity and heritage, I've never heard it put so beautifully before. But I love that. I love that in terms of you know, what the goal of, our, of what us as government should be, you know, is that intergenerational transmission of identity and heritage. It's so eloquently put. But I guess one other part of the, you know, our Constitution that it lays out is it also talks about this coexistence. You know, so when we talk about what's reconciliation, what's title, you know, in, in, our, in our definition of reconciliation and title, coexistence is a reality. It's been, it's been a reality for 100 years for the Haida Nation. It's built into our constitution that mandates us to promote it. You know, this is not just about the Haida Nation and, you know, we're going to kick everybody off of Haida Gwaii once we get title. So, and the other thing is, you know, we're a government, so there's some very boring parts of us. Right? We have a, you know, we have our policy department, uh, we have our resource policies, and, you know, we, we do a lot of, uh, the, of, the, of the role of the government. Sorry, I, I, I was not moving along there. So that's all up there, but I'll share this with you. So I guess uh, just quickly about CHN. So like I've already said, we're not a band council, we're not a tribal council, we're not a society, we're not a corporation, we're not anything, we're not a legal entity. That doesn't mean that we don't have legal entities, so we do have a financial arm, so the Secretariat of the Haida Nation is the, is the arm of the Haida Nation that, you know, possesses assets, it's where all our financial management takes place, but us as the CHN, we don't exist in the Canadian law. We're a government of people that get together under our own constitution and, and that's how we exist. 
We exist under Haida law, so you know, it's very important to, um, uh, to note that. But we are, you know, very, we've matured into, into the national government of the Haida Nation, you know, representing all Haida citizens. It has nothing to do with Indian status. So the council is elected by Haida citizens from uh, the two communities on Haida Gwaii, so Masset in the north, Skidigat in the south. Those are the two communities where everybody converged on, you know, during the times of smallpox. It was a matter of, matter of survival. Everybody was just converging as a matter of survival. So in Masset and Skidigat, that's where the majority of our population still, uh, still reside. The population of Haida Gwaii is around 4,500 people. Not about 60% of those are Haida. But we have about 5,000 members worldwide. So all Haida people have a say in, in, the, in the function of us. So again, has nothing to do with Indian status. Haida citizens uh, are determined based on hereditary baseline. So we have a citizenship act that's, uh, that's getting ready to be enacted as we speak. And we're now trying to get people to you know, shed themselves of the, status, of the status card and that identity and sign up as a member of the Haida nation. What we're, we're encountering in all this is, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of resistance. Because you know, a lot of people are asking that question, well, what's in it for me? You know, like Jason was saying yesterday, for the non-smokers, they don't get cheap smokes, but they get cheap gas, and they're saying that. What's in it for me? You know, and we don't have anything for them other than pride. You know, and the fact that you have your own identity that has nothing to do with you know, a number or, or an archaic legislation. It has to do with where you come from and who you are. So when they sign up as a member of the Haida Nation, you know, you have to be linked to a hereditary baseline. You know, it's very simple. Um, but, but the resistance has been there around just, you know, shedding that mentality of the Indian Act. But our people are the ones that, that give us our authority and make up, you know, who we are and what we do. So the lawmaking authority is, is reserved to all people. And we're governed uh, in a legislative body called the House of Assembly. So every year, uh, for four days a year, the nation comes together for the House of Assembly, and that's where we get together uh, and we, do, we debate the issues, but we spend many days uh, tabling resolutions, and then those resolutions are debated and voted upon, and then those become the mandate, you know, for us as the elected uh, to move forward. But I guess it's also important to note here that uh, the Haida Nation is not just the elected government, you know, of, of us as we sit here today. Our hereditary leaders uh, also sit within the government. They're, they're acknowledged in our, and laid out in our constitution. We used to call them somewhat of our Senate. You know, they, would, they don't sit there as voting members of the, Haida Nation, of the Council of Haida Nation, but they play a huge role in terms of, of how we make decisions on, on all matters. So when we're stuck on issues or we're, we're trying to wrap our head around complex issues, we always go to our, our, our chiefs. And you know, they always are, are giving us that guidance on how to move forward with that. But also uh, within the Council of Haida Nation, we do have both chief councillors. So the band councils, you know, do have seats at our table, you know, and they do work on a lot of the nation, uh, you know, the nation's work. So all this comes together, you know, not only through the constitution, but through, you know, a document uh, called the Haida Accord. So when people always ask about the uniqueness of the Haida Nation, yes, we're an isolated island. Yes, there's no territorial overlap. But that doesn't mean that we don't have our challenges as a people. You know, our hereditary leaders have their traditional territories. The band councils have the reserves that they manage. So it's not all hunky-dory where we all just live together and, and hold hands. It's challenging, it's tough. We've had times where the nation was getting pulled apart. But we always were able to bring it back with that common vision that was laid out before us, you know, around this, you know, this mission that we're on to reclaim our islands and reclaim what was rightfully ours. So even as recently as uh, 1998, you know, the nation was getting pulled apart and we had to put something forward with everybody called the Haida Accord. You know, that says, okay, everybody, if, if we're gonna do this, everybody has to stop. Everybody has to put their collective belongings into the middle of the room. And then we all agreed to do this together. So we had to do that in 1998, where everybody, the band councils, all of our chiefs, us as the Council of Haida Nation, we all said, okay, we're in this together, and, uh, and off we go. So this is all leading to, you know, the stand at Lyle and what happened after it. So after Lyle Island, uh, this is where we started seeing very significant change after we started coming together. Um, we were successful in negotiating what's called the Guayhanas Agreement. 
So Gwai Hanas was, uh, was setting aside uh, the southern part of Haida Gwai and protecting it. So Trevor talked a little bit about you know, the, the wording in our agreements. The Gwai Hanas agreement lays out you know, the same thing. It doesn't talk about title. It doesn't say whose land this is. It actually says we agree to disagree on those things, but it lays out that you know, because of the history of what's happened down in this, this area of Haida Gwai, that it's important to protect it, pr uh, pr protect it in perpetuity. And so the Gwai Hanas Agreement does that, and we do it together. You know, that peaceful coexistence I talk about is that two authorities coming together, you know, for a common purpose is what Gwai Hanas, the spirit of Gwai Hanas is. So we protect this for, you know, with Canada. So it's laid out uh, at a, at a co-management table. Uh, Jason Alsop represents us, you know, at the archipelago management table. So there's two Haida, two Canada, and now there's uh, even a fisheries component to it. And it works on consensus. So the decision making of what happens in this area is, uh, is a delegated to the A and B board and they govern uh, you know, cooperatively uh, what happens in Guayahanas. So this area of Guayahanas encompasses about, uh, it's about almost 1,500 square kilometers of land. Um, yeah, and I think right now, I'll, you know, maybe uh, Jason can add a little bit of details, but we're at very advanced stages of, you know, a very comprehensive management plan moving forward around, around how this area is going to look uh, moving forward. But this all happened uh, in 1993. So the next, uh, the next quick chapter, and I'm fast forwarding due to time, was uh, in uh, 2009, uh, we took another step. You know, and I think that's the interesting thing about reconciliation is that uh, in 2009 was the first time we used the term reconciliation. So again, we, uh, we went to the tables uh, with British Columbia this time, and we're talking about the other areas of Haida Gwaii. So now that we protected the southern part, of course, we were saying, well, what about the, the other areas? And so the negotiations ramped up uh, with the province, and we signed what's now called the Kunstagu Kunstaya Reconciliation Protocol. So what it was, was again, it was an agreement to disagree, you know, on title, but it was an agreement to come together to protect other areas of Haida Gwaii. But again, it was also born out of conflict. So in 2006, uh, we had another big conflict on Haida Gwaii called Island Spirit Rising. And it was forestry based around, you know, the rate of logging again and where it was taking place. But we all, uh, and us with our neighbors on Haida Gwaii all got together and there was massive mobilization on the ground that led to this change. So these products of reconciliation are always born from a place of conflict. That's the cycles that we're, we've always, we've always been, been in. So Kunstigu Kunstaya is significant in that sense of that it, you know, it, it brings about another chapter of co-management. So Trevor Russ, uh, who's, who's now the vice president of the Haida Nation, back in you know, these times was not, but he was the one that was sitting at uh, the Haida Gwaii Management Council, which is the delegated authority that was created to govern the land base of the other areas of Haida Gwaii. So that's, um, you know, that's a big step, you know, I think in British Columbia and perhaps even in Canada, you know, to have the, you know, the Haida Nation and British Columbia come together on Haida Gwaii to make all land-based decisions. So no decision is made on the land base without our, our consent. So that's significant. Um, so I think you know, some of the products of, uh, of, the, of the reconciliation protocol is like I said, the management council was the creation of that. So another delegated authority. I think I saw yesterday, somebody was talking about you know, what's the keys to this transitional governance, you know, that, that devolution of power. It also includes us. You know, I think one of the things that we need to do as First Nations is to involve as many people as we can in decision making and not have this top heavy government you know, where you know, people resist that. So I think you know, all these products of reconciliation have those ingredients where it's getting our people involved uh, in the decision making. So the Management Council has some very um, significant functions. What it did is it brought about the land use orders. So we went, we went through land use planning on Haida Gwaii for many, many, many years. And what it materialized in is these land use objectives and these land use orders that govern how to treat the land base. So it doesn't say that logging doesn't happen. I mean, keep in mind that even the story at Lyle Island was not an anti-logging stand. It was all about how you do logging and where you do it and, and following Haida principles. And I'm gonna end with, with the Haida principles part. So 
So it laid out the land use orders about how logging can be done. So there will be no more clear cutting. You know, there'll be done, you know, a certain way of doing logging in certain areas. And it also laid out the rate of logging. So the Haida Gwaii Management Council also sets out the allowable annual cut on Haida Gwaii. So at the peak of the, uh, of, you know, the devastation years of, you know, that 3,000 cubic meters, when Trevor sat at the management council table for the first time, they went and they set a new AAC for Haida Gwaii. And it came down to 900,000 cubic meters. So it was still done very scientifically. So I mean, you know, Trevor may be able to talk about the process. Like, I can't even wrap my head around the complexities of it. But it basically was answering one question is, what does sustainable logging look like? And so that's the practice. That's, where, that's why we were at that table trying, trying to do those things. It also brought in uh, a new era of what we call carbon offsets. So with all those protected areas of Haida Gwaii, we're now selling air. So keeping those trees in the ground and selling you know, the, you know, the carbon that those trees pull out of the atmosphere and you know, the offsets that people want to purchase in today's day and age, we are now, as we're sitting here, are selling carbon offsets for keeping trees in the ground. So we're proving that there's an economy in preserving our trees. We've also negotiated some uh, revenue sharing agreements. So just like other members in British Columbia, we have re uh, revenue sharing agreements you know, on stumpage pay to the province for areas that are logged. But we also have our own tenures. So another part of what happened in, in this chapter is uh, we bought out the biggest tree farm license on Haida Gwaii. The same tree farm license that we litigated against that led to the Haida decision in 2004. So it's pretty interesting when you think about just the journey that we're on is that that same you know, the duty to consult and accommodate precedent. You know, we ended up buying that TFL. We now have it set up in our own company and we're now, and then we also so, so, so set, you know, the allowable annual cut that company has to live by, you know, and we're now trying to do it, doing it sustainable. So that's basically, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that was the strategic objective of our, of our previous leadership was to do those things. But this all leads up into one thing, you know, which is really around the well-being of our people. You know, we're a government, and yes, these are our jobs, but at the end of the day, that's our objective, the socioeconomic well-being of our people. And, and that's, you know, where, where we're at right now as a government is really trying to get to the ground, you know, with all these things of how do we change the lives of our people and, and make life better. So what we've been doing, you know, since our government has come into place is implement, implementing the agreement. You know, so I think another one to Stephen Cornell's presentation is, that's what we're doing. We, you know, we came in on Monday morning and said, okay, now what? What do we do? And, and we've been doing it for years now. You know, it's very unglamorous work. It's very unappreciated work. But that's been our focus uh, as a government for the last, you know, I've been in for almost five years now. We kind of inherited that. And I'll end again with, you know, how that all happened. But the um, last part on Kunstagu Kunstaya is it means in, in Haida language in the beginning. So for us, reconciliation is an incremental process. That's the model, that's the approach. It's not treaty, it's not a big bang for everything. We just believe that the incremental approach of how we're gonna do these things is the right way to do it because we have to develop our capacity as we go along in order to properly uh, implement these things. So I'm getting near the end. How am I doing for time? Am I doing okay? Getting close? Okay. So just to get to, I guess, another visual image, keep in mind that map from 1980 that showed all the tenures. So in 2010, this is what the new map looked like. So after the Guayanas Agreement was implemented or, and put into place, and Kunstagu Kunstaya was brought into place, all that green is the protected areas now. So 52% of Haida Gwaii is now pro protected forever. 48% is that blue area. Uh, you might notice those, uh, those white blots in the middle of it. That's the fee simple lands. So that's private lands. And that was something that we left off the table in the negotiations, just because we would never have gotten this far if we would have tried to solve that riddle for now. Mm -hmm. So we had the foresight to say, let's put fee simple in private lands outside of this for now, and we'll deal with that another day. So that operable area, that blue area, keep in mind, it's all governed with the land use orders. So that's, you know, that's how that area is governed, and we control 60% of it with our own tenure. So we go from the little yellow dots map to you know, managing the green you know, and, and having a presence on 60% of the blue. So it's a significant, a significant journey for us in a very short period of time, from, you know, basically in 30 years. 
Um, in 2010, we brought in the, another new area, which is to get into federal jurisdiction, which is around water. So that's where we're at right now um, with, uh, with the government, with you know, the new government. Uh, we've now, you know, we're talking with them around the water, you know, and all the federal jurisdiction. But in 2010, we signed what's, the, what's called the NMCA, the National Marine Conservation Area uh, within Guayanas, and uh, expanded the role of the Archipelago Management Board that Jason sits at. And so they now have a, you know, a marine component to Guayanas. So I'm going to end with, uh, you know, I guess, you know, really where I want to end this whole conversation, which is, you know, what are some of the lessons learned uh, from the Haida Nation? So I really want to emphasize this better, you know, this better together point, which is, you know, that none of this happened just because of the Haida Nation. We did this, you know, as a, as a people of all of our hereditary governance, um, our band councils, but we also have a very unique setup on Haida Gwaii where we have municipalities, we have, uh, you know, unincorporated communities that are governed by regional districts. And at, at certain periods in our history, we've all had to come together. You know, we've had protocol agreements with our neighbors, you know, where they've gone off and said boldly that they would rather live in a world governed by the Haida Nation than the provincial government and, or the federal government. So there's people on Haida Gwaii that, that, that understand where we're coming from because they live there. They've come from there. They're born there. They respect our principles and values, that's, that's who they are. So that's a key ingredient for everything, is that you have to figure that out, you, you have to have your neighbors with you. The second point, which I can't remember, like I said, I almost feel like I'm stealing people's presentations from yesterday, and I swore I wasn't, but there's changing our mentality of a government. You know, fight versus flight, is that we're, we're excellent at fighting. You know, I think our history, going back to our reputation as the Haida, but even in uh, you know, the last 30 years, we're a pretty formidable force in terms of our fight, our ability to fight back against things. So that's not where we're at, we are right now. We're in an implementation chapter, you know, and it's not about fighting. It's about, you know, trying to figure out how we're going to do this and what do we want to do? What do we want to do in managing these protected areas? What kind of presence do we want to have? What kind of policies, do we, what kind of economic presence do we want? You know, so that, that's been the shift in our mentality. And, you know, I guess the, the reality in Gujao, you know, who's my predecessor as president, you know, kind of duped me into, into this position, you know, by saying the fight is over, Peter. You know, that's, you don't have to do that anymore. We, we did the fight. And so I said, okay, and I came in, and of course, very quickly, the fight was not over. Uh, there's more flare-ups on the land base, you know, so we're talking right now about uh, the second, another step in reconciliation with BC. So we're talking about rec like Kunstagu Kunstaya 2.0. So we're continuing that work, but you know, there's still more fighting and there's more fighting in the water. So our shift is, you know, shift into the water and I know lots of fights uh, with DFO around certain things. But I guess another uh, key thing is around, you know, this implementation uh, is a journey, not a destination. You know, it's one of those realizations we've had, you know, four or five years into this. And I think even going back, you know, keep in mind Guayanas in 1993, 24 years you know, that they've been implementing that agreement and they've now evolved into, you know, you know pretty amazing in terms of what they're, they're able to manage. But you're always continuing to the next play, the next step in implementing what you're trying to do. You'll never ever get there and I guess that's the realization we have is stop waiting to think that you've gotten there and celebrate, you know, getting there. So you just gotta realize that and once you realize it, you stop, you stop chasing. You know, you just try to have these small wins and, and just keep moving along in that incremental approach. One other thing, I, I guess getting into sort of some of the challenges you know, is that we have a re-emergence of our hereditary systems. So residential school, all, the, all those chap dark chapters of our history had a devastating effect on our hereditary governance. You know, and I think we, you know, that's just a reality. But we're seeing a re-emergence of it along with everything else. You know, because I think as we, our government has stood up, We've, it, you know, what's not in this story, you know, is a very strong cultural reemergence. Uh, Leslie, Leslie Brown, who's here, uh, her father and her uncle, who are Robert and Reg Davidson, you know, they, in 1969, you know, started the reemergence of our culture, you know, which was preserved through all that dark time. But not too long ago, you know, 50 years ago, our, our culture was underground. It was almost lost. And those gentlemen, along with many others, you know, brought our culture back. You know, but all these things now as they rise up are, are being layered into how do, this, how do these fit into the governance? 
You know, that's why we're here. You know, we're here to figure out, you know, with the reemergence of our hereditary governance, the reemergence of our culture, you know, the transition of our government under our title, what does our government look like tomorrow? So the hereditary governance is a good problem in the sense that they're all, you know, they're getting empowered, you know, and, and, and they're at the table and they're opinionated. And so it's, it's, getting, it's getting exciting, but it's also very, very challenging. So the last point is uh, we have an active title case. So all these things that we've been talking about is in light of a mandate from our people to pursue a title case for Haida Gwaii. So from, lands, uh, from mountaintop to sea, the sea floor, that's the scope of our title case. And for 15 years, we've been, been preparing evidence, getting ready uh, for court. So as I sit here right now, uh, we actually are uh, in court. We, they haven't set a trial date yet. Um, but we're getting ready for court. So I'm just going to end with, uh, with some maps again that just show you. Oh, am I going backwards? Oh, I'm upside down. That's why. Sorry. <laughs> so this is uh, one quick uh, visual, you know, but showing you some other significant steps we made. Is This was the first uh, pole, totem pole to go, to go up in Guayahannes in over 100 years. So after the Guayahannes Agreement was signed in 93, uh, in 2014, uh, we raised this pole down in Guayahannes to you know, get back into our traditional territories and, and get back to, uh, to our way of life. And this is uh, some other visuals to, you know, to show you about you know, what the fight was for. You know, so why we were trying to protect the forest was to you know, per perpetuate our culture. And this is just some examples of you know, what, uh, what we use the forest for and the value that we have, that we have in it all. So I guess I want to end with um, you know, I guess one thought that we had around you know, Canada's approach to, um, you know, trying to engage with us on this nation-to-nation -nation approach is that they have these new 10 principles, you know, and, they, and we've been meeting with them and they've been talking to us about, you know, how do we come together using those 10 principles? And I guess one of the moments we had uh, some, you know, some, an aha moment with our chiefs is one of them got up and said, well, why do we have to adapt with their interpretation of principles? You know, what about our principles? And so everything that I've talked about in this story is rooted in Haida principles, we have six of them. You know, and these are taught, these are taught to all of us, you know, as we grow up as, as young people. Now, one of them is, uh, is respect, yakudung, respect for all, all living things. You know, that's, that's the one principle that we live by. Uh, responsibility, you know, treating the land with respect. You know, we're all brought up with, you know, with learning these things. Uh, the interconnectedness, that's the third one. Everything depends on everything else. So our territorial claim for title for Haida Gwaii is based on that, is that the land, the sea, the air uh, is all connected. So our, our approach to uh, title is not you know, certain areas or just the reserves or just Guayahannas. Our claim for title is for all of Haida Gwaii because that's, that's our way of life. It's, it's all connected. Uh, balance is, uh, is the fourth one. And the, the term that we always use at home is that the world is as sharp as the edge of a knife, which is that it's, it's, very, it's very easy to tip you know, in terms of trying to find that balance. But that's the job of what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance everything. You know, we're trying to, you know, all values and principles, but um, seeking wise counsel of our elders is the fifth one. So we always go back to them whenever we get stuck on things. Uh, one really quick example of it is that we, uh, as we prepare for issues in the court case, so one of them was uh, this very complex question about what do we do about the third parties? So while I'm in court right now, you know, w with Canada and BC, they basically say, well, what about the third parties? Are they going to get served in the title case when we set the date? And of course, we're saying no. Well, this is not a fight against our neighbors. This is a fight against the Crown. So let's keep it at that level. But BC and Canada are trying to you know, short circuit court and try to cause delays. So they came in and said, no, we believe that everybody should get served on Haida Gwaii. So the third parties of Haida Gwaii is around 7,000 to 8,000 of them. You know, it's from the landowner and the municipality to the forest company to, so third parties is a very vague, vague issue. And we don't believe that, you know, that we have to go after the third parties yet. So when we were stuck on, do we go after them right now or later? We went to our elders and we asked them, what, what do you guys think? And one of our elders, um, Guagana, had this beautiful story, you know, talking about, um, having to like live with people, having to live with, you know, live with our neighbors. And she, all she did was told the story. And we, and, we, and we found out the answer. And so it went into court. You know, our elders, 
wisdom is still guiding us in this very complicated environment. And then the last, uh, the last principle for us is reciprocity, which is also you know, the giving and receiving. So we're saying, we're countering back with Canada to say these are our Haida principles. You want to talk nation to nation and you want to talk about moving forward with us, then these are our principles and you can, you can, you can try to find a way to understand how you tap in, into those with us. So I think that's it. I know I probably went over my time, but um, yeah, we're here for the next day and a half and uh, yeah, I think that's probably it. So however for your time and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you.